Join us today for Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz and our after show, Buzz Reaction. I'm Ruth Nelson, joined by Hall of Famers, Mick Haley, Bob Bertucci, and Brian Gimolero, bringing you the most current issues and trends in volleyball. Our weekly news show has leaders in our sport provide their perspective on the questions that are asked, along with the discussion on topics that are current and ones that are affecting all of us. Our news flash. The FTC sues Facebook, which could impact college athletes in NIL. The Federal Trade Commission complaint asserts several types of arguments that attempt to depict Facebook as unlawfully eliminating meaningful competition. Well, this complaint was filed on the same day WME Sports announced the signing of All-American LSU gymnast Olivia Dunn. With 5.5 million followers, Dunn is the most followed collegiate athlete on social media. Some experts believe Dunn could become the first collegiate athlete to earn seven figures through NIL. Well, is NIL just for D1 athletes? Listen to this. In 2019, athletics organizations began to amend these rules. And in October 2020, the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, the NAIA for small colleges, passed the first legislation of its kind in college sports to allow its student athletes the opportunity to be compensated with NIL. Well, Chloe Mitchell, a freshman volleyball player at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, is believed to be the first college athlete to make money from her likeness. Mitchell has 5,000 followers on YouTube, 48,000 on Instagram, and almost 3 million on TikTok. An audience she garnered practically by accident in April 2020 during her final year in high school. She co-founded a company and a mobile application with her dad called Playbooked that helps athletes connect with social media sponsors. Oh, a tool, a tool that her daughter says has been a big advantage. Check it out, playbooked.com. Registration is open for 2021 ABCA convention in Columbus, Ohio, December 15th, 18th. Jump over to abcaconvention.org to register. Today, our guest is no stranger to any viewer who watched the USA Women's Indoor at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Yes, indeed, we have the best libero, libero, and however you would like to pronounce it, which country <laughs> you're in, at the Olympics, here with us today live, and we welcome this outstanding player who assisted the team in winning their first gold medal since volleyball became an official sport in Tokyo in 1964. So let's head over to Southern California, where three-time NCAA National Championship head coach while at Long Beach, Brian Gimolero, will introduce our featured guest today. Brian? Well, this is very exciting for me. Ruth, first, thank you. Uh, wonderful news. Now I learned all about things I had no idea about. But this is very exciting for me. I remember this young person coming around all the volleyball courts and all the gyms and and little did I know, but she probably knew that her, she was to be going to become a gold medalist. And this is Christi, Justine, I'm sorry, Justine Wong Arantes. And I've known her since again, she's been maybe five or six years old and I've known her mom. Let's give it a little background. People don't realize how good a beach player you were. Uh, first of all, you were the youngest AAA beach player ever in history and became a great player then. Then you went on to the high school, great high school career and club career, and then went on to the University of Nebraska, where you became an All-American and a national champion. This past year, the only preseason tournament before a pre-Olympic tournament was in Europe, and you became a gold medalist there and became the outstanding libero in the tournament. Then you went on in just last month to lead the United States 
in its first gold medal ever and becoming voted, not only your statistics showed that you were the best passer in the Olympics, but also you were voted the best libero in the Olympic games. So welcome, Justine. It's nice to see you. Yes, nice to see all of you as well. And thank you for having me. Um, it's been nothing short of a journey and I'm just, so, so blessed to be a part of, you know, history with um, bringing home the first gold medal in women's volleyball history. So thank you for having me. Well, my first question and my really only question is everybody's <laughs> dying to know about your Olympic experience, all the viewers and including us coaches. Tell us about the Olympic experience. Yeah, um, I mean, with it being my first Olympics, um, I really had no idea, idea, idea what to expect. And um, you know, I could ask Jordan and Faluka and Kim and Kelsey, who had been to the Olympics um, before, I could ask them a million questions, but I don't think until you have set foot in an Olympic village and all the things that come with an, an Olympic experience, you know, you don't know. Um, but I think, oh my gosh, there's just so many memories, but I think the one thing that kind of is disheartening to me is of course not having my family and my friends there so that's the one thing that I wish and hopefully you know can look forward to is just having them there and so um but overall I think it's one country and I and I can probably ask all of my teammates this if one country could have hosted in a, a COVID Olympics it would be Japan because they are the most accommodating people most hospitable people um and so whenever we had places to go or an agenda to follow, they were so, so accommodating and very well organized, very friendly people. So super, super happy to have um, returned to, to Japan. You know, you gotta, uh, you first for all of us, would you hold up that medal? You have her on your neck? <laughs> of course, <laughs> oh, yes. Look at that. Wow. Blinding, blinding. Oh, yes, <laughs> that's right. I know yeah, your family, you, you, you have a wonderful family and, and I, it's so, it was so exciting to watch them on TV and I know them and it, it was so nice. I wanna turn you over to Hall of Famer Bob Bertucci for a few questions. Hey Justine, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, uh, just wanna ask you a little bit in the beginning of pool play, there wasn't much mentioned about your play. And as the tournament went on, the announcers began singing your praise and, and you, you were playing, you know, better and better. It seemed like every game uh, that you were in, you know, what was the difference that allowed you to get better as the, as the tournament, you know, went on? Well, I think, I mean, that is a huge testament to my teammates and allowing me to feel comfortable and, just owning my space on the court. I think over the course of my national team career, I've started off as a very timid player and just not knowing kind of my role and the expectations around me. And so as I've grown more and more comfortable into the role, and I think that obvious, that helps me in, um, in my eyes going overseas and getting gaining that experience, um, playing all year round volleyball. Um, I think that helped me tremendously and just gave, gaining a lot of uh, mental stability and confidence. Um, but I think as the tournament went on, I just really understood what I needed to provide and I didn't need to do anything out of the ordinary and out of my element. And so I think honestly, everyone that was on the court and the supporting cast, everyone on the team understood their roles. And I think that was a huge, um, you know, defining factor and just resulted in a lot of success because everyone really, really understood their roles and <laughs> played it so, so great um, during the whole tournament. Well, I think that was definitely true for you. I, you, know, you, you hear coaches talk about, you, you know, you got into the groove and I think you've explained that really well because you were definitely there as, as the semifinals and the finals, uh, you know, happened. What, what are you planning to do now? So I have a few weeks left until I head to Germany for my professional team. Um, so right now, just 
kind of introducing my body again to volleyball and just <laughs> weightlifting. Um, yesterday, I went into ASC uh, for the first time. I took two weeks off just to be with uh, my family and my friends and my loved ones, just to, you know, enjoy the moments and um, just cherish those with everyone, especially because um, this year, this Olympics, they could not be there. So I was trying to, you know, they're vicariously living through me with all the pictures and videos that I've showed them, <laughs> but it's just not the same. But yeah, so now I'm, I'm here for a couple more weeks. I'll go into ASC again and just get some touches, get some lifts in and uh, try to get back into volleyball shape again. <laughs> okay. Now, did you have any trouble with, with getting your contract this year? <laughs> um, so, so I actually signed my contract before the national team season. So, um, as, um, you, you guys all know, um, libero, it's a very tough position to get a contract overseas. So my only worry was that if I waited till after the USA, um, season was over, that there might not be any jobs left for me. So my team last year wanted me to resign. So I said, yeah, I mean, they've treated me great. I love it here in Germany. So I'm going to resign, you know, before all the, all the craziness happens. I mean, <laughs> obviously not knowing that we were going to win a gold medal, but I just knew that this was going to be a, a very long and hard summer. So I kind of wanted to get that um, done before I came back to the state. Well, that's great. And that was exactly the reason for the question, because I know for Liberos, it's <laughs> It's always very difficult uh, to, to land a contract and, and find a place where, you, where they want you and you're comfortable. I'm, I'm glad that worked out for you. Uh, my last question before I pass you on to Mick is, why don't you talk a little bit about the dynamics of the team? It was, it was really fun to watch uh, you know, on television because it seemed like you guys all got along and you were very close. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yes, I would love to. I mean, I've, everyone that has asked me about the team dynamics, I've said, had the same answer because it's true and um, everyone can attest to this on the team. We spent the past year and a half during the COVID year and all the quarantining and us staying home and being apart from each other. We hired a new position on our staff and in our program, um, being a sports consultant coach. And that was given to Sue Enquist, who is has some ties to USA softball and UCLA softball. She was there for 30 plus years and has a huge background. But um, over the quarantine period, we the staff had always had a guest speaker on Zooms with us. And she actually was one of our guest speakers. And I think, I mean, she just was hilarious and just like a ball of energy. And I think everyone loves that about her. Um, and she always was a fan of us, but never really knew exactly what volleyball was and how, you know, competitive we were and things like that. But um, I think there was kind of a joke between her and Jordan Larson, like, oh, it'd be fun if you came on staff with us. Um, and that actually became became true. And so they had interviewed her and she, you know, nailed the interview and our goals kind of aligned and so she hopped on staff with us and she got to actually travel with us to Tokyo so it was amazing to have her there and just you know be that support staff for us and just really uh, check in with us every week and so um, I mean my my hats go off to her especially with her giving just all of the time and energy that she's put into our whole program. Um, I honestly could say, I don't think we would um, have been as successful without her. That's great. Well, I know Mick has some technical questions he'd like to ask you, uh, you know, about your play. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mick. Okay. Hi, Justine. Hi. Thanks, thanks for coming on the show. It's really, really exciting. Um, you know, I think I coached the first Olympics where there was a libero position and Stacy Sikora was in that position. Um, and some really funny things happened, believe it or not, in the Olympics. First of all, Danielle Scott was the middle blocker <laughs> on that team. And at one point, Danielle went back to serve and uh, she lost her serve and she decided to stay in the game. Well, Stacy, being the libero, came into the game also. And we had a stack left and a stack right. 
with three people each and a setter. And we played three points in the Olympics with seven people on the floor and the referee <laughs> never noticed. <laughs> Oh, is there anything God. like that happen with you guys in the Olympics or in any part of the Olympics that uh, is something worth mentioning? Oh, my gosh. No, I mean, probably the closest thing that could come to that is just um, Luca Slabe, our assistant coach, is in charge of the substitutions and um, that iPad that sits right next to him. And it's always just so funny because, he, you know, you only have – a certain amount of time to challenge a ball and so he's always looking so frantic and we're like Luca calm down calm down it's okay but I couldn't imagine how much stress that um, he's put under with having to make those decisions and listening to Karch for the okay so but no nothing that can come close to that it's pretty <laughs> funny <laughs> Well, that's pretty good. Well, well let me ask you. No, if you scored, did you score during that time, or did you lose the score? With seven <laughs> players, did you get worse or better? Actually, we scored two points and and there then lost. Then you lost. Uh, we sided out. Uh, well, no, we didn't side out. We lost two points, and that's how we stayed out there that long. Finally, <laughs> finally, when we we finally sided out, we got out of there. But. But Justine, here, here's a, here's another question for you. Is there anyone in particular you modeled yourself after? And I'll, I'll put a second part of that. Uh, do you have certain role models that you look up to uh, that have helped you along the way? And I asked that uh, in particular because I, like I said, I got a chance to coach Stacy. Uh, I had uh, Nicole Davis uh, in my, on my collegiate team, as well as Natalie Haglund. Those are some pretty good uh, ball handlers there. And I know you're right in there with the mix. So what about those things? Yeah, of course. Um, I think one, two people that kind of stick out in particular, Kayla Banworth and Kelsey Robinson. Kayla, I mean, both of them are former Huskers, so they're kind of close to home for me. But I think Kayla in particular, because we've kind of had the same pathway to the national team. And um, even Coach Cook, he says all the time, and when I was there, he said that, you know, we started off as these like little – little pipsqueaks that didn't hardly, you know, you could barely get a word out of us. I mean, and that was true my freshman year. And then to kind of blossom into, you know, these loud liberos that, you know, you can hear them on TV. And it's funny when sometimes I, I watch my matches, I'm like, am I that loud? Like I can hear myself, but um, yeah, Kayla is just a tremendous player. And um, I just looked up to her when she was on the national team because she was, probably the best passer on that team and just took took up so much space on the court. And so I try to emulate my game after her. Um, and then Kelsey, I think just what she brings, you know, kind of with non-volleyball, I think she just brings a lot of, um, a lot of energy and just a lot of positivity. And I love that, especially for me, I'm, I think I play my best when I'm loose and when I'm smiling and I'm just, you know, very carefree and just playing with a lot of passion. And I, I respect Kelsey for that because it seems like every day she's just wanting to get better and she's wanting to, she's so competitive. Even when we're playing bogger ball, she's always trying to kill every single uh, and win every single point. So I look up to her in that way and just trying to, you know, get better every single day and try to, and she's one of those, those, uh, players that you know she didn't get a lot of playing time at the Olympics but she was in the gym trying to make us better she's coming in to serve and pass and trying to stimulate every single server on the on the team that we were about to play and just trying to make us better and push us seven that we're playing to um, reach our potential that that's pretty neat you know there's a lot of coaches that we talk to and the consensus amongst a lot of these coaches is that you were the MVP of the Olympics because of your consistency and the way you held up under all the pressure through the entire games, which is, you know, pretty nice pat on the back for your position because it doesn't always get that kind of attention. And yet for people to be able to single you out like this uh, in a team sport that helps, uh, you know, doing things that don't get a lot of attention, but that really helps your teammates be good. That's, that's pretty special. Um, what do you do technically that separates yourself from other Libros? 
Hmm. Um, I, when I was looking at the questions ahead of time, I actually couldn't really think of an answer only because I feel like technically I'm, I'm pretty similar to everyone that kind of comes into the gym. I mean, we have a system and a philosophies that we kind of practice every day. I think the main thing that separates me from maybe other liberos is just my intangibles, what I can bring um, to help elevate the, my teammates around me and just my, my passion and my fire and my energy. I think um, that's what I pride myself personally on is doing and bringing to the team is if some, if one of my teammates start, you know, having the best um, performance um, right then and there, you know, how can I make them better and try to relieve some of that pressure off of them? I, I would tell you, give you a hint. Also, you should also say that it's where the ball goes every time you touch it. That's what <laughs> separates you from the other people. <laughs> That, and thank you for those answers, but uh, we have a high appreciation for your play, your skills, your attitude, and, and your teamness. So thank you so much for being on. Ruth, go get her. Okay. I can attest to Kelsey because she has over 100,000 TikTok followers from the Olympics, and she was the queen of the TikTok, where all of you guys were all enjoying yourself from I saw the food you were eating to how you were traveling. So I'm going to give Kelsey a high five on that. All, All right. right. So there's a question. Um, as young players, you know that you, not only you, but many players are, I call it one dimensional in the sense that you get put into a category because of your size. And mm -hmm. so my point to you, when you got put into that category, how did you respond and how could you respond to all these young aspiring athletes that now aspire to be you they don't aspire to be six foot two they aspire to be you yeah I mean that's awesome and I I love it I love that I can inspire especially um with us hopefully putting women's volleyball kind of on on the map and allowing more athletes more young girls to aspire to be like um you know Jordan Larson and Saluka and everyone on the team I think it's amazing I just would say to those young girls don't stop playing other positions you know you never know you might hit a growth spurt later or you may find other passions I mean still to this day I miss my setting days um, but unfortunately that's not the case for me anymore um, but just keep keep playing keep playing all the way around if you can keep playing beach volleyball I mean I have just such a lot such huge gratitude for the sport of beach volleyball because I feel like it has made me such an all-around um, player um, to this day and so yeah I would just encourage all of those young girls keep playing as much as you can whether it's indoor beach volleyball you know with higher level athletes older people that's that's kind of how I got introduced to the sport I was playing with my mom and dad and all of their um all their friends who are much older than me and just digging balls from them. And so I would just encourage that. Okay. So have you always had a dream of being on the Olympic team? Is this a dream or did this just happen within the last six years? Yeah. I mean, it's always been a dream of mine. I think I mainly kind of saw myself playing beach volleyball only because whenever I was watching the Olympics, I was with Sarah Hughes and we were always on the beach and playing and we were together. I mean, we played club volleyball together also, but I think we were kind of seeing ourselves as Misty May and Carrie Walsh, you know, Sarah's got that long blonde hair and I'm, I'm Misty May with the brunette hair. So we just kind of try to idolize ourselves and uh, try to mimic ourselves as, as them too. But yeah, the Olympics are always so special to watch every four years. So I definitely um, envision myself there. Okay, so the last question I have, and then I'll go back to Brian, is are you going, this is from someone who wrote in, are you going for another gold medal? <laughs> of course, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's fantastic, because someone wanted to know that, you know, because some people, when they get their gold, they're done. But I think you have more ambition, you have more energy, it seems like you've grown through the years and become exceptional. It's like we always say, you still have some more to give. 
because you yeah. haven't played your best, but you played your best when you needed to, but now you got to play even better and influence more people. Okay, Brian, I'm going to go back to you. Well, has it, does it, has it sunk in yet that you are considered the best libero in the world right now? I mean, you are considered the best. Has that sunk in? Can you put your <laughs> mind around that? No, I really cannot because I've honestly, I haven't even watched the gold medal match. I have just been kind of in and out of California and just all over the place and getting tugged here and there, which I love uh, for sure. And I'm so, so grateful for, you know, just my, the village that has come with me to, you know, every club volleyball tournament to my high school days to my Nebraska days. And so I'm just trying to let it sink in that, um, that we've made history. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool that we can say that and, you know, no one can take that away from us. And um, just the special group of people that I've had the honor to play with is amazing. Yeah, I just, it, it was amazing to watch you and to watch you grow up and to watch you develop and become this, this, I just saw you as a calm player throughout the Olympics. You were, you were steady. And I, and I love that you impart to young people that the most important thing you can do is know your game, but to make your teammates better. All the great players I've ever coached found ways to make their teammates better. And you've referenced that several times today. And uh, I'm just really proud of you and glad to know you. And I'm, uh, I'm, so I told you before the interview here, is there anything else that you would like to say that we didn't ask you? Uh, I mean, I think I would just say, uh, you know, if you have a dream that you are kind of envisioning, just go ahead and keep chasing your dreams because I know a lot of young girls and, you know, young boys um, kind of see our, our trajectory going upward, but, you know, they don't see the ups and downs that come along with it. I mean, for me, myself, I wasn't even on the team that qualified in 2019 for the Tokyo Olympics. Yes. So that just goes to say that, like, don't ever give up on your dreams and just keep going. And you never know where it may lead you. And I, I'm just so, so happy that I've had such a great support system to allow me to keep going and push myself. I hope everybody heard that. I mean, I hope everybody heard that what happened in 2019. And we, I think so often that people give up on a lot of things just before they are going to make it. And, you know, and I'm glad you stuck it out and it's, it's been wonderful. So Ruth, where are we? Are we actually? We are, we are right on time. So Justine, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on. And we all appreciate all your honesty and greatness. And for all those coaches that are interested in our consulting services, please go directly to our website, volleyballmastercoaches.com and click on the contact form. And we look forward to customizing in-person or virtual clinic for you and your program. You missed one of our shows, jump over to Instagram and click on our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook at Volleyball Master Coaches, Instagram and Twitter, VB Master Coaches. Want to make a difference? Please remember to renew your AVCA membership. This one organization that represents all coaches at all levels when lobbying for changes that are needed in our sport. You can make a difference by registering avca.org. Stay on Facebook Live after John closes today as we will hear Master Coaches recap on today's buzz and a conversation about Olympic volleyball tactics. Now let's go to our buzz and buzz reaction digital partner, Dr. John Foreman, who will update us on his most recent project, John. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, my current project is just trying to get through preseason here at Madai. But I can reference something that I talked about before in terms of doing some research on home advantage of volleyball and about it being presented. And that actually happens tonight in Korea. And yes, I will be awake and involved with that, although I recorded it, so I don't actually have to talk. Uh, but after tonight, I'll post it and make that available and people will be able to check it out. So look forward to that next week. And with that, on to the reaction. Justine, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Really good, Justine.
for those joining us for Buzz Reaction for the first time, today we will begin with our master coaches recap on today's Buzz show. And we see Justine still here. So we're going to talk about what she talked about and mm -hmm. also address specific trends from matches that were observed by master coaches at the Olympics. So master coaches, are we ready for your reaction from today's Buzz? And don't feel pressure because Justine's on. <laughs> well, I, I think I think the the fact that Justine talked about her team and and trying to make everybody on the team better, I, I think that's kind of one of the roles I think a Libro has to perform, uh, you know, in that position. Yeah, yeah. the other thing that I, I took from that, Bob uh, and Brian talked about it, and I, I totally agree. But um, I've seen athletes quit just before they get to the point that they're going to be good. Uh, we, we constantly, and, and I'll, I'll point to the current Hawaii coach, Robin Amal. Uh, Robin was the number two setter on the Olympic team for 2000 uh, going into the last year. And uh, she was about ready to go home. And we kept saying, you're just about there. You're just about there. And she says, I'm always just about there. When do I get there? And, and uh, that, that's exactly how the athletes feel. But she stayed. She ended up being our uh, the starting setter uh, the last six months of that quadrennial, went on to set a whole nother quadrennial and go to another Olympics, at least. And uh, you just never know. Another one on that team was Heather Bowen. Uh, she came from nowhere. She was the third or fourth middle. And then one, one day in Dallas, Texas, we were playing Japan and she warmed up and she bounced balls like BBs. We had never seen anything like that going off the floor. And uh, I looked at Toshi and said, she's going to start today. She is in it. And we never took her out for that whole rest of the quadrennial. And she went on to be one of our greatest medals. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot to what Justine said about uh, hanging in there and and uh, keeping the keeping the faith and keep working hard. Yeah, you're right about Heather. I, I remember having her on the World University Games team, and and you know she just you know she looked like she was a little bit heavy, maybe not quite developed completely yet. And then, like you said, a few years later. Oh, she just really came into her own. She was just wonderful. And then I got in trouble with Danielle Scott because I always said to Danielle, who played for Brian and played with Ruth a while, uh, Danielle, you're the best Olympic blocker, uh, best blocker in the world. Uh, and she and then Heather came on into her own. And I said, Heather, you're getting to be the best blocker in the world. And Danielle calls me up and says, hey, I'm the best blocker in the world. <laughs> so I, I had to I had to have two best blockers in the world there. So That's right. Okay, so Justine, you were, you know, I want to tell you, I, I train a nine-year-old and her idols have been Lang Ping and Flo. And all of a sudden, after the Olympics, she goes, you know, I've always wanted to be a hitter. And we're talking nine years old, but to watch Justine play, maybe I should be, how do you say it? A liberal, a liberal? What, what? <laughs> she goes, it doesn't matter how you say it. She says, I think I want to be her. So you're talking about a nine-year-old that's mm -hmm. now looking at what you've done and what you've done as a role model for all these. Because I have four liberals that I train and all of them have been wanting to look up to someone your size. You know, it's, it's, it's like anything else. And they are just so excited. So no, you are making a bigger impression than you will ever realize in what you've been, become. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, I think the other thing that Justine said, and I think it's I want to say it again, and that is that the the great players that I was lucky enough to coach, every one of them had one thing in common, uh, and that was that they found ways to make their teammates better, and they all did it differently. They all had different personalities to do that, but they all made their teammates better, and when the great players know how to do that and it benefits them. They get the benefit is not only to the players around them, but it also benefits them. It puts them in the, in a mental frame and physical frame that they can rely on their teammates and their teammates can rely on them. And I just think it's that message could not be, I could not make that message stronger. So anybody who wants to get better, 
just find a way to understand your teammates, find out what makes them, what motivates them, find out what ways you can get them to perform better and learn how to do that. And if you can do that, you're going to be special. That's I how you stay to totally positive all the time. You're yeah. always helping somebody else. That's, yeah, you're that's staying absolutely. out of yourself. Yeah. yeah. You stay out and of you that. Take yourself negative. out of the equation, and you're always you're always doing something to help somebody else. Yep. You're exactly right, Brian. It helps you uh, more yep. than you know. Yeah. I yep. actually have a question for Justine. Would you say <laughs> that? I'll let you go, Justine. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you can go if you want. But do you think being a setter helped you understand the game better when you became the in the position that you were in in the Olympics? Because there's so many uh, players that are defensive specialists, liberals, and I always encourage them to set because it helps them understand. Do you feel it helped you? And how did it help you? Yes, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I think just growing up as a setter, you know, you're always having to lead in probably the biggest way on your team. Um, you know, everyone kind of compares the the setter to a quarterback on a football team and I think that's just it um you you have to see the game in many ways and and I don't envy the setters on my team at all because <laughs> at this point there's just I mean at this high of a level they have so much to worry about and so much to be thinking about but I think kind of having that um being introduced to me when I was younger um um, just allowed me to really see the game in a bigger light. And so um, transitioning into the libero position, it was like, oh, like, oh, I don't have to worry about any of these things anymore. Um, but I do, I am, I am, you know, I understand a lot of what is going on in Micah and, and P Jordan Poulter's mind. And so, um, and, and that's, and in, in the Olympics, there were some examples that like, I could see like, hey, um, this middle blocker is running our middle blocker. So I can kind of, you know, and sometimes they're not able to see that because they have so many different things that are going in their head. So if I can kind of relieve them in any other way, like I, um, they appreciate that for sure. So I think that's helped me tremendously. Justine, I, 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 I've always felt and I do believe that a uh, the team is a reflection of the coach, the personality, everything. It's a reflection of the coach. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I've got to, I should have talked to John Cook and Karch. They, they overlooked you as a setter. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, what I, but more than the reflection of the coach, it's the setter and the libero. Uh, I think that that's the, that's the personality of the team. But what I watched has just been reiterated by what you just said. And that is that I saw the setter, the setter uh, because things were changing. I saw that you did something in my mind that was amazing. And what it was is you took the leadership when you needed to, and you were complimentary to the setter when it was appropriate. So I thought that you found a way. That was a maturity, a maturing factor that I thought you were you, when you knew, like example you just gave, you took a leadership role, a personality role to when it was needed, but then you quickly reverted to being the complement to the setter when I thought it was it was necessary also. And so the reflection, the the personality, of the team is reflective in those two people, but the one of them and usually libero has to be able to change. And you did it. And I was really impressed with that. I could be wrong, but I don't like to admit it when I'm wrong. So it's, <laughs> hey, it's a good thing you stayed on. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I saw. Yeah, thank yeah, you. So I mean, you talked about Justine being a, a setter and, and, and how that helped her as a libero. You know, oftentimes I, I wonder uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen this or not, but no matter what setter you take you and you, you know, you're playing a practice and you put them in a, a passing role. Now they have not practiced serve receive at all. You put them into a passing role and all of a sudden they can pass as just about as well as anybody else on the team. And I just wonder if it's because as a setter, you're watching the pass so often that you actually learn the correct way to pass. 
which gets back to the advantage of maybe doing some setting early on in your career. Yeah, I mean, I've never actually thought of it that way, but that's that's definitely what our setter co our setters coach Aaron Virtue has um, kind of emphasized and taught in the in the national team gym. It's like the setters are always having to read the pass first and making sure that they can see the the angle that is going to be directed towards them. And so that you bring up a great point, and I've never thought of it like that, but. Um, yeah, that could very well be true. Bob, what I think is, what I think is it's a hundred, first of all, everybody who does anything else, everybody feels like the other person's job is easier. You know, <laughs> it's easy to pass when I'm a setter. And then <laughs> you set when you're a passer. And then also, uh, until you start thinking about it, also there's a honeymoon period until <laughs> you start thinking about, wait a minute, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, Bob had that happen to me. Um, I was the second setter on the USA team uh, on a trip to Mexico and the coach put me in to pass uh, because we were suffering greatly in that area. I hadn't passed in a long, long time, but I, I felt like, and, and the setter was encouraging me, just get it close, just get it close. And, uh, uh, but it just seemed natural because you do watch the angle of the arms as a setter so that you are ready for any deflections. And I talk to young setters when I'm training them about reading the past and they look at me as if I'm crazy. But uh, I think it, when you play, you, you never want to lose a ball, so to speak. So you do do that. And I think mentally you do practice those angles. So when you go out there and get thrown in that situation, you make sure your platform is right where it should be and the angle is where it should be. So I think there's a lot to that. I think it, it's, it's actually a form of mental, you know, mental sure. training. And, sure. and there's some studies out that say that, you know, visualization and mental training, you know, ha have a direct relationship or correlation to what you actually physically practice, but so just I was thinking, I was okay. thinking I should clarify the seven player thing in the. Uh, <laughs> I think you should too because you should yeah, have. How, been how, how is that possible? So, how'd you get, so how'd exactly. you get hired? Well, that's what you say. How is that possible? So here's the situation. So Daniel Scott goes back to serve. We were working on keeping Daniel in the game in that rotation to hit out of the back row. And it wasn't something we did all the time, but we had trouble scoring in that rotation when she left the front row. And so uh, we had we had good passing. We didn't need her to pass, so we could leave her in there, but we didn't always do that. And so it became, <clears throat> we were trying to get players into the match because you know you don't get a gold medal if you don't play in the Olympics. Justine, I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, if a player on your team did not play in the games, they don't get a medal. Uh, oh, wow. and we were we yeah. were worried about that so we were on the bench working on substitution patterns and not paying too much attention to this particular set so Sakura, uh no one told her not to go in because this was the first year of the libero going in and out of the game as, as a free sub and so she thought, well, uh, it's my time to go in because nobody said, hold off. Danielle thought, I'm hitting out of the back row. If you know how Danielle thinks, she's out there until you take her out, right? Yeah, she didn't want to so come out. She doesn't know. To never her. wants to yeah, go out. Ever. You have to tell Danielle, you're coming out, Danielle. So uh, we got them both out there. And the most interesting thing is they, they figured out without thinking about it, stack left and stack right. So we had a stack on the left side. We had a stack on the right side. The setter was feeling comfortable. We had two middle backs and they, they ended up playing on either side of the free throw circle. If I can give you that visual, you know how the free throw circle always ends up in the middle back. They shared, and so they they shared the notice, position. <laughs> yeah, they didn't notice each other. And it was the strangest thing I have ever seen. So we lost the first uh, that first point uh, and then somebody hit the second point out of bounds. And so we received for a third time before Danielle actually hit out of the back row and scored, but, but Stacy was in her way and Danielle had to push Sakura out of the way to get to the ball to hit it. And that's when they recognized we're not supposed to both be out here at the same time. <laughs> I, still, I still can't get over how you didn't score. I mean, your defense- I know, really, you had good. more players. <laughs> you got seven people, come on. Well, we had 
We had too many people. You know, there could be too many people at the party and they all want the ball. That's the problem. <laughs> Justine, since you stayed on, Justine, um, do, you know, Eric, I want to talk about you as a 12 year old and you and Sarah winning, winning tournaments on the beach at 12 and getting a triple A rating. Talk, talk to us a little about, about that. You and Sarah were really good together. Yeah, yeah. I think it was probably all of the years that we played together just nonstop. I mean, the only team that we were not on a part of, um, we went to different high schools. But other than that, we were on the same club volleyball team and uh, we played together on the beach. So I think it was just like that, you know, indescribable connection that we had by always being with each other. Um, and so we just enjoyed playing with each other and just getting to experience a lot. I mean, we we got to travel to some pretty cool places as as young girls and young teenagers. So, um, I mean, she's definitely a friend that will be a lifelong uh, friendship. How, how many, do you have any idea how many tournaments you won? Do you have any idea, the two of you? I don't. I We have a trophy case at my house that, um, uh, have displayed all the medals from like my youth and then some from Nebraska but yeah I'm not really sure I'm sure she has even more with uh, USC so <laughs> <laughs> but you played at the beach at Nebraska on the beach at Nebraska yeah but we were not good <laughs> it was it was actually pretty funny we our opening match, I think it was my junior season. Um, they had just come off of winning a national championship and we also did, but for indoor. So I think Kevin Wong was announcing it. He's like, all right, the battle of the national championship team. Although we were on the beach and we were like, oh gosh, we are just going to get pummeled. So <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> well, it's funny. I tried to get Sarah to set for the indoor team at SC. Uh, when oh, she yeah. came for sand, uh, we had lost our setter. And, you know, when you lose your setter late and you can't replace them, uh, Sarah seemed to be the perfect uh, person. And uh, she thought about it and thought about it and then decided to focus on the on the beach game. <laughs> but uh, I always wondered how good we could have been had, had she decided to set. You guys would have been playing across the net against each other. Uh, yeah her setting and you in the back row so it would have been pretty fun okay so have you been approached to ever go back on the sand with somebody oh uh, I think jokingly people have but I say you don't want me on the sand anymore <laughs> I mean it would take years for me to get back into shape <laughs> so you think there's a big difference um, between sand actually, Yes, I think just the physical aspect of it and having to be in beach shape. I mean, when we were out in Tokyo and we got a chance to see April and Alex in the village, they were saying they were playing in like 95% humidity <laughs> levels and they're wearing ice um, pack vests during timeouts and water breaks. And I'm like, yeah, we are so thankful that we are in an indoor sport. We didn't have to <laughs> take in all of those factors. So, yeah. But um, I'm actually going to hop off. I yeah. want okay. to thank you guys. Thank you guys for your thank time you, Justine. and having me. Uh, oh, thank you, Justine. And congratulations again. Yeah, so, you were thank great. You. Thanks. Thank you so much. Great yes. to see you guys. Thank okay. you, Justine. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that was great. Yeah. She was wonderful. Well, no, so we still John here. kept the guest. Huh? We still got John on. I didn't realize John was on. I didn't have the, the no. He's on, he changed his practice today, so he's, he's still on. He's oh, asleep, uh, John. Okay, so are we going to get anything into the experience of the fabs that we saw in the Olympics? You want to tape that, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Bob was got an idea. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know that serve receive pattern we saw during the Olympics where the, you know, the women had the, their right side player swing, you know, swing it all the way around the back side of the serve receive pattern and hitting out of the right side. I thought that was really interesting. And I guess my thought is, you know, Koch, Koch came up with that because back in 1984, he was kind of doing something similar to that when they, him and 
him and uh, Aldous Berzins, I guess, was passing. They were the two passers. Karcher in the 5-1 would swing to the right side and hit it, to, you know, at the net. So, uh, well, I don't know what you guys think about what the pluses and minuses are that. Well, I, I said this to you before. I, I didn't think it was really anything new. College teams have been doing that for a long time. Um, they they like to specialize. I, I thought what was interesting is I'd like to know how many gold medal spare, squared coaches are now in the grave over that because they don't like to change and do anything different. And the coach was from that discipline and uh, he changed to, to help his team be successful, which smart coaches should do, not just do the system. Okay. So that might open up a whole new uh, bailiwack of things to talk about, but, but my, my opinion on this, I think you should do things like that. I I'm, I'm big in specialization. If you, if you can score in a certain spot and your left side, can hit three times on the left side. I, I like that. I, I'm not uh, of the opinion that uh, you need to hit your left side hitter, left and right, uh, but I do like them hitting out of the back row. Well, do, do you think the reason why Koch was doing that was to keep their left side attacker on the left side or prevent the right side from crossing in front of the serve receive and the problems that might have caused? That That's, that's possible. Uh, well, he did it with Jordan Thompson originally when he. First I would think more. He wants yeah. he wants the person on the right side to block and hit, and so you get them over there the best way you can, and depending upon your system and how you pe have your people lined up, you get them uh, either close to the net and have them back off, or you take them in a, a larger loop, and hope that the servers can't pin them someplace. But Jordan did hit in the 2019 preliminaries in Shreveport. She did play that position and she did get outside then she went over to the right side well we th we thought she might be a better left side than right yeah. side however those bb's she was hitting in the first two or three uh matches of the olympics were amazing uh -oh. out of the back row and out of the back right and out of the right side i i thought she was the primary reason why usa got off to such a good start is because she carried the load yeah I think it's a universal problem that everyone has had in the left-handed player hitting from the weak side, from the left-hander from the left side, given the distance from the setter, you know, it's not, it's a long set and not a short set. So it has to cross the body, which has always been, it's a difficult set. It's a, sometimes it's too flat by the time it crosses the body. It's always been a universal problem and there's always been, everybody's tried to find a way to make, and I thought what Karch did was a real simple way to get around it and not having the confidence in the left hand or hitting from the left. So I think it was useful, um, but you know, like you said, a lot of people are in their coaching grave from trying to do that. So yeah. if the well, Lang, yeah, Lang Ping, she also kept her left or left out on the left side the entire yeah. time, but she yeah. had a lot more time to build her up to the Olympics versus yeah. with Annie. Yeah, you know, and, it's, uh, and it's a different set. It's a different set to a right-hander and left-hander when the setter is not in the middle of the court. When the setter has five meters in front of them and four behind them, the, the, the way the ball is released and, and, and to cross that left-hander is a different set. And you could see that it was hard on television, but you could see the difference for the Chinese player on the left, the left-hander on the left the way they set her was different. They, it was a slower set. Yeah, the USA is running so fast that uh, many times the other option to that, Bob, is to you keep your left side on the left and sometimes you run a two ball in the middle to that right side and the middle then goes for a one foot. So you run fast to both pins and you got a second tempo in the middle. Uh, that That's uh, another way that people can do that. Uh, if you want three fast uh, tempos plus quick out of the back row, then you do it maybe like Karch was doing. And I think it depends on the ability of what can the left-hander do? Maybe the left-hander can hit a quick ball three meters away from the setter. Uh, and then, you know, the outside hitter can loop behind them. Or yeah, like right. you said, a second tempo ball or, or a second, you know, combination play with the middle. I mean, there's all kinds of options 
Um, no Korea, one's ever able to figure it out. <laughs> Korea ran a left inside. They ran a three with a left side two inside. Right. I haven't seen right. that for a number of years. That was one of Bal Keller's play right. in playbooks uh, way, way right. back when. And that that really bangs those blockers together, especially especially on a tight bunch. So uh, I thought it was interesting that the Italian coach for Korea had the Koreans doing that. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's also interesting, I, you know, and again, when we have Karch on, you know, in a few weeks, maybe we'll, we'll ask him that question. But uh, one of the advantages of, of running that player around the back of the serve receive, now maybe not at the Olympic level, but at the collegiate level, the blockers would lose track of where that, that hitter is. And it's very, very possible to have an open net when she comes around to hit on that right side. Uh, kind of like when you used to stack left and you'd have three three attackers on the left side receive and serve and the back left would come out come out of the, the back row and everybody would forget that you know you'd run a 31 and you'd run a, a a front one and then this left back passer would come around and hit maybe a shoot on the left side nobody would realize that was a an eligible hitter does that happen a lot in men's volleyball those guys don't pay attention to that <laughs> No, because they're worried about screening. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, my goodness. Now, as long as they can jump high and <laughs> go as fast as they can, it doesn't matter whether they block the ball or not. That's right. It, it matters as long, as long as they're putting a lot of energy into it. That's it. Say, so, Bob, you could solve your screening problem if they put blocking the serve back in. Yeah, I think they, they should do that. But, of course, I think the oh. logic... The logic of the receiving Whoa. team has such an advantage over the serving team. You know, I don't see that happening any, anytime soon. And that rule only lasted, what was it, two years? Not when very long. <laughs> well, year and a half, I think. But it's, 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 it's appropriate now because if a ball can hit the net and fall down one, in, you know, one foot away from the net and be a point for the server, yeah. then the way to combat that is to block it. The block it. You know, yeah. So I mean, you. How do you defend that? How do you defend that serve that falls over the net and everybody high fives the server? The server made a mistake and everybody thinks it was a great serve. <laughs> it well, was a great serve. <laughs> I lost a match like that, Brian. I, we we were two and two with Washington. It went 14-13 in the fifth uh, timeout. The Washington server comes out. She goes from one to five right down the line there's nobody over there of course where the pattern is it hits the top of the net drops over two inches away from the the yeah. center line and they win the match yeah, that should have been a point through. for you by the way if it, <laughs> if it, i mean how can you reward a mistake yeah i mean it's just it's ins it's the hey, most they practice those role. serves yeah sure they do <laughs> yeah <laughs> now, that was that right. actually was kind of for amazing a trip that to, uh, to that. the final four. That was actually a trip to the final four. And, yeah, no, and I. It's a Washington was hosting. Yeah. yeah, if you if they serve it to your left side and it falls over, you know, there's not many teams. You're going to bring your left side to the net. I mean, come yeah. now. So there's nobody there. The setter's not there. Nobody's there. The middle's not there. So. Okay, so I'm going to give you, in tennis, I told you this earlier, if you guys remember it, it's 66 weeks ago. It's mm -hmm. called a squirrel when it rolls on top and it goes in. So what you need to do is plan a blocking squirrel attack. Yeah, should that's, allow it to squirrel, I should allow it to block it if they're going right. to allow it to go, yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. All right, well, guys. I wonder we, if you could block it if it hit the, hit the net first. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, we are out of time. For those coaches that are interested in our consulting services, please go directly to our website, volleyballmastercoaches.com, click on the contact form, and we look forward to customizing a special clinic for you. Very special shout out to over 90 guests who have shared their insights with us and our viewers over the past 66 weeks. 2021 ABCA convention in Columbus, Ohio, December 15th to 18th. And you may jump over to abcaconvention.org to register today. Be sure to tell your friends about our weekly news show. Thanks for joining us today. And guess what? We will see you next week on The Buzz.
here cut appointment.